All right, let's call the meeting to order. We'll have Ms. Roll call. Ms. Hetland? Present. Mr. Jacobson? Ms. Makovsky? Mr. Morrison? Here. Mr. Patterson? Here. Ms. Salmon? Here. Ms. Waller? Here. Okay. Uh, I don't believe we have any changes to the agenda. Uh, next, we need to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Anybody have any questions or changes? Some would like to move that we approve them. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, we don't have any public input, so we're going to go ahead and start with the grant presentation by uh, Claire Happel. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, So um, thanks for giving all of the, um, the artists who have been granted these awards um, the opportunity to come talk to you guys. It's nice to have it kind of close with um, explaining what we did and telling you how, um, how it came across to the people who we presented to. Um, I presented three concerts. Um, they were... Um, concerts of works for oboe and harp inspired by Rilke's sonnets to Orpheus and we presented them at the Urbana Free Library at Clark Lindsay Village and at the um, University of Illinois Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Um, the idea for the concerts came with two pieces um, for harp and oboe that use Rilke's words from these poems as inspiration. Um, Eliot's Elliot Carter's trilogy and Harrison Burtwistle's Orpheus Elegies. And um, Carter's trilogy is the first piece that an oboist friend of mine, um, Chris Antonio, and I played together. Um, we worked on it for a year um, before performing it um, in 2012. We worked on it during 2011. It's a really difficult work. And um, we made sure to rehearse it a lot um, before performing it in um, Chicago and New York and then um, recording it, finally, after all of the performances. And um, the te text that Rilke um, uses, I think I go like this, yeah. Um, as he calls it a motto for the work, is um, two stanzas from Rilke's Sonnets to Orpheus. And I've put it up there. Um, in playing the work, I was in contact with the harpist for whom it was written, this, a woman named Ursula Holliger. Her husband is the famed um, Heinz Holliger. And she highly recommended these um, pieces by Harrison Burtwistle. It's 26 pieces, little movements for harp and oboe and countertenor based on this, off of the same text of Rilke, um, these sonnets to Orpheus. And um, we wanted, to, I wanted to put together a concert with both those pieces, but then to fill it out. And so we decided to try to commission a composer to write another work um, that also is inspired by those poems. Also, um, and what um, Douglas Fisk, the comp composer we commissioned, ended up doing was writing a work for harp, oboe, and voice, and using the text of the sonnets um, for the vocal movements. Um, in researching the poems for the concert, um, I found there, that there was a Rilke collection, there is a Rilke collection at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Illinois that has these really beautiful books, limited edition collections of um, these poems with illustrations that different people have, have drawn for these limited editions. So I thought it would be neat to make a concert where people would have the music, but also these illustrations to see connected to the poetry and also present some of the poetry related to the music. Um, and um, I felt that it would get a wider variety of people there too, um, people maybe not just interested in the music. So um, I felt that there were three, three ways that the concerts aligned with the goals of the Urbana Arts Grant Program. Um, one was all the concerts were free, and um, we tried to make them to pick venues where we get different, um, different populations. So um, at the library, there were people as 
as young as eight years old at the mm -hmm. concerts. Um, and then at Clark Lindsay, of course, it was um, people who were more retired. And then, um, and then, <laughs> um, and then um, at the um, University of Illinois one, it was people who are either working at the library mostly or students. Um, college students. And then um, it also provided opportunities for emerging artists. The oboist, um, myself, and the singer are all kind of early to mid in our careers and um, the composer as well. And then um, the last goal um, of creating programs of artistic excellence, um, we tried to, to use, um, make a program with great music and um, a program that could appeal to people outside of just musicians interested in the specific composers we were presenting. Um, so here are some pictures of people who attended the concerts. At the left is at the Urbana Free Library. This is after the concert and someone trying out the harp. Um, and at the right lower one is, is at both, uh, both the ones on the right are at Clark Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And you can see at the top one, we have this multimedia behind us, so we tried to project some of the pictures, and I'll, I'll show some of those in a little bit. So um, as I was mentioning, um, we tried to, to pick venues that would have a lot of different um, people coming to them, but um, also venues that had their own series that would bring people to it automatically who kind of followed the series at those venues and um, ones that had infrastructure of creating promotional materials. So this, this one here is um, the one for, for the Urbana Free Library concert. And as you can see, um, it has the, some of the text of the poems in blue there. And then at the bottom, it talks about, um, about the concert and that the Urbana Arts Grant um, funded the new work of Douglas Fisk. And this is a poster. Um, I didn't have a PDF of it. But it's the um, Rare Book Library series, and um, we're listed on it. So um, I had originally applied um, in the grant. I had um, proposed to have the funds go to both the obo getting the uh, oboist travel, the commission of the composer's work, and a small honorarium for the, for the vocalist. Um, and we ended up using um, the because of what the proposed amount was and what the funds were, which were really generous, um, a really generous amount, I ended up using the funds for the composer's commission and then paying the, for the oboe's travel and the um, small honorarium for the vocalist um, just out of personal funds. So um, I thought I'd briefly show you some of what we presented at the concert um, and then if, if there's time, play a just a tidbit of um, Douglas Fisk's work. And that's, that's another neat thing I think that came from it was not only were people on those days of the concerts um, able to be presented these artistic works, but because it was also for a commission, then it's a work that will be able to be played by many people and um, not just us on those dates. So this is the um, place where Rilke wrote the poems. This is a girl whose death, it was, she was a friend of his daughter's and when he found out about her death, um, he, it, it made him, he felt that that was the inspiration for the poetry. We also tried to show letters that he wrote um, about the really creative fervor that um, he was in when he wrote the poems, which he wrote in um, less than two weeks and they're, they're some of his master work. So here's, um, an example of one of the um, one little snippet of a poem that inspired one of the works that we had projected for people to see as we played. Here's a scan of, of some of the things from the Rare Book Library. And then there was also a woman, a violinist, who, um, whom Rilke felt was her playing of Bach's violin sonatas at the time he was at this chateau was also an inspiration for the poem. So I played um, one of uh, movement from one of Bach's violins, not us on the harp. Um, here's an, uh, there's another, um, there was another example of one of the pictures and here's some more. Um, and lastly, um, we have this video of, I just took one of the oboe and harp movements. <coughs> um, I think if I just press play, it'll do it. Not sure. 
sure. Um, maybe we won't get the video, but we could have the audio. They're really short. There's nine short movements that he wrote. Okay. And this is the concert at the Rare Book Library. And then it does go into an open heart movement, but I think it might be too long. So, I, <laughs> um, are there any questions? Anyone have comments? Looks like a great project. Cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. For exposing it to so many different people in the community. Too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a good idea. idea. And yeah. who were the Thank other you. two collaborators? The two performers, the oboist and the the one I saw, but uh, who was the mezzo? The em the mezzo, yeah, Emily Alcorn. She's okay. a student, yeah, at at Illinois, a master's student. And the oboist, she lives in New York. Um, and um, yeah, as I um, mentioned, um, she um, and I have worked on this Carter, one of the pieces that we right. played, yeah, before. And um, um, yeah, as a an oboist from New York, it was a yeah. nice combination. Yeah, Barbara. yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for doing it. Yep. Okay. Uh, I assume we're still waiting t for five o'clock to do the one, f the uh, Asian American one. Yeah. Okay. They're here. They're here. Oh. oh, okay. That's what I thought. Hi. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, should we move the order then? Yes. Okay. Next thing is going to be the grant presentation by em Emily Roman uh, from the Amer Asian American Cultural Center. Thank you. It's amazing how they transformed that building. <laughs> <laughs> you know where this is? It's down the street. It's just east of Smith Music Hall on the south side of the street in the first block. They've, they've expanded this building, put new facade on it. Mm. It's one okay. of those old houses that, in that block with all the old houses. Yeah. Okay, um, so my name is Emily Roman. I'm a second year intern, um, student intern at the Asian American Cultural Center. I just wanted to start off to say um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today about our AAPI Heritage Month, um, our Asia Fest celebration. So um, the AAPI Heritage Month allows us at the Asian American Cultural Center to actively pursue our mission statement. With that said, our mission statement is to promote cross-cultural understanding of Asian and Asian American experiences, as well as to provide educational and cultural support for Asians and Asian Americans in our community. Asia Fest is one of the biggest events all year, and as a second year intern, I am excited to say that I'm gonna be assisting and planning it again this year, as well as I did help last year as well. So we engage the community in outreach to many different organizations, both on the university campus and off to spread education about Asian and Asian American culture to the community of people of all ages, little toddlers, and to um, college students as well. 
we expanded to the Japan House and Arboretum from Lincoln Square Mall in previous years. And this year, we were at the Arboretum. Attendance jumped from 250 people to over 100 attendees. And specifically, funding has allowed us to support and empower our community's API performers' artistic development through small honoraria. Not only were we able to share their piece of Asian and Asian American heritage to attendees, but they were now able to invest in developing their art for a more widespread exposure in the community. This funding allowed us to make these performances free um, to the community. So here's a picture of our volunteers and the staff. So this year there were many volunteers and we were lucky to get this many volunteers. We, I would say we had approximately 90 volunteers. Um, we had five full AACC full-time staff, 16 AACC interns, over 60 performers, and 13 different cultural performances. We had a total of 27 community organizations and, and student organizations. So at the event, we did have different cultural cuisine that people had could taste for free. We had pakoras and dumplings. And the reason behind our choice in these foods is because we wanted to provide two different types of cultural cuisines. One, um, pakoras commonly from South Asian cultures, and then dumplings commonly from East Asian cultures. Um, many people think that when they hear Asian or Asian American, they think of maybe Korean, Japanese, but it's a lot more than that. It can be South Asian or Southeast Asian from Vietnam or Singapore, um, India, and so on. So here we at Asia Fest, we also had different interactive educational booths. So organizations, the 27 that I previously spoke about in the past slides, um, they held different interactive cultural booths with different activities and information that supported Asian art, such as origami, calligraphy, coloring, Asian lanterns from henna tattoos, and Chinese chess. These were hosted by the 20 different student organizations and community organizations. The goal of all participating organizations was to build a stronger bond with the Urbana community, as well as showcase the rich API diversity that exists on our campus community. So in this slide there, this was the layout of all the different organizations that came to host a booth that day. All of these organizations ultimately wanted to spread a knowledge and educate many families and children from the city of Urbana who might not have known about many of these countries or organizations. Oftentimes, like I said before, many people think of only China, Japan, or Korea when it comes to Asian communities. These organizations illustrate the rich, organ rich diversity that exists while building community amongst them. So in this slide, we have a picture of a booth hosted by the McKinley Health Center and the Counseling Center. Um, what benefited from that is that the McKinley Health Center talked about the different health disparities that existed among Asian Americans and um, Asian international students, which was very beneficial to the community because oftentimes this, these communities don't know to reach out to the resources that we have on campus. Additionally, the Counseling Center talked about stig stigmas that exist among Asian and Asian American students. Um, so students were able to know the resources that they have on campus, like these two. We had also student groups from the Multicultural Advocates Housing, so they can find familiar faces within their own dorms, um, who to go to when they need help. We had Asho for Education. There was the Korean Student Association and the Intercultural Horizons team. And of course, we had different performances, as I previously mentioned. This year, we practically tripled our number of performances at Asia Fest, with 13 performances and showcasing over 60 performers. These performances included everything from Korean salmori drumming to Korean K-pop hip-hop dancing. We wanted to display the large variety and range of talents of these local artists, including students themselves. People got a glimpse of traditional movements and they even 
did these performances in traditional outfits and sounds from different regions as Philippines, Korea, India, and China. Um, so on the left, we have Jainet, who performed a Surambushi dance, which is one of the most famous traditional Japanese songs. This was first sung by fishermen in Hakukaido. The dance moves and lyri lyrics shows different stage of fishing, like navigating the ocean waves, dragging fish nets, and lifting heavy objects during the song. And in the song, um, they chanted different words to encourage the men over the long hours of their work. On the right side, we have the Philippine Student Association, and they performed um, Tinolabong, which is a dance of the mountain people in Penulan and Laktugan Kapis. This dance was named after um, a bird, and like birds, as they peck at the ticks, flies, mosquitoes, and other insects, the dance imitates the movement of the birds. So we also had Westview Elementary School performed a group called ZDT and Pacific Islander and Friends. So Westview Elementary performed a Chinese lantern dance and it was really cute to see all these kids come out. Um, we saw a Korean drum dance and then we also had um, a Vietnamese dance come out. The ZDT, which stands for the Zinda Dance Team, performed a hip hop slash Bollywood fusion piece that combines the dance styles of two different cultures. And then the Pacific Islander and Friends performed a traditional Hawaiian hula dance and showcased the Pacific Islander heritage of API Heritage Month. So as a second year intern, um, I'm looking forward to planning Asia Fest again. And looking back on the experience last year, it was so great to see the cultural diversity that existed in all these different performances and booths. Um, it is now my junior year at the U of I, and I would say that Asia Fest is one of the most culturally diverse type of programs that I've ever seen. I've never even seen Korean drumming until I came to campus, or even um, met another like Filipino on campus because I lived in a different dynamic um, back at home. So being able to have such an event here where students and even the community members can come to is, um, it's really great to have because it not, there aren't many communities, I would say, um, that hold such a wide scale event to really see the diversity that exists in um, Asian American and Pacific Islander culture. Um, so it was really impactful to see as a student, but also impactful to see um, as an AACC intern to see um, everything I helped plan come to life at this event. So without your support, we would not be able to bring these performances to Asia Fest to inspire children to continue to learn these dances and songs as well as showcase these talented artists. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Well, it sounds like you've done a great job of growing this and involving a lot of the groups in the community, so I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, it's very impressive. Did you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, you know, put in help. <laughs> but still, I, I appreciate all the effort that went into that. It's very, very impressive. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, big impact. Let's see. I guess now you'd like to be, we're going to be talking about the grant program. You had some suggestions for changes to the uh, grant program. <laughs> uh, 
Hi, my name is Miranda. I'm the public service intern, and I wanted to discuss with you some changes we wanted to address about the grant 2016, and we would love to hear your inputs and suggestions on uh, what you think. So first off, um, these are the current categories for 2015, which include here and now, Envision 365, Creative Mix, and Urbana Festivals. Um, and these were the four categories that were presented before. Um, however, there were some overlapping problems with this and um, confusions that happened. Uh, an example of this would be an Urbana resident who is also an emerging and professional artist. So the category would be whether or not we should put here and now or Envision 365, Can we stop here and just say, explain if, if there's any difference between those two categories? Uh, in either the amount awarded or any other part yes, of Yes, so there, there are differences in each category on, mm -hmm. you know, breakdown on how much um, funding is provided. So that's another, you know. Yeah, I know uh, each of the different categories, but I'm just talking right now about the here and now in the Envision 365. Those two. Those two, well, this is kind of just an example of um, mm -hmm. what someone could be having trouble with on breaking down whether or not which grant they should apply for and which grant we should let them, you know, fall into. <laughs> Does that, did I answer the question? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so what you're saying is that the clarification on the application form needs to be clearer? So pe I yes. mean, people have, we've been doing this for a while, so people have obviously decided one way or the other what they're going to apply for. Yes. But has there been feedback that generated this? I'm just curious. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, now Pauline is out right now, so I'm right, right. kind of taking over. Um, so this kind of was a, a brief conversation um, with her about how some people would call in and ask, you know, I'm doing this project, which one do I apply for? I'm confused about it. And then after, you know, breaking it down, also Pauline or someone else who's helping with the project was also confused about which one it would be in. Um, because like I said, there are some overlapping, um, you know. Guidelines. Mm -hmm. Guidelines, exactly. So this is a kind of a, a thing that we would like to try to clear up if possible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so with clearing this up, we suggested that maybe we should have new categories and be more location specific. And uh, part of this would be a category would be nonprofit organizations. Um, having an individuals, you know, individual projects and group projects, which would include troops and ensembles. Um, and also kind of an idea would be uh, festivals too, something that we didn't really bring up, but to maybe keep in mind. Um, well, and that well could fall under group projects too. Right. right. Um, well, except we've had, in the past, we've had different criteria for the, that they had to meet right. for a festival. Right. that were more stringent mm -hmm. so so maybe we should add, uh, keep it as a fourth category is, is that's a that's a possibility uh, <laughs> let me also mention that one of the reasons just historically that we had here and now uh, versus envision was the idea that it's urbana taxpayers money and so perhaps urbana artists should get somewhat of an advantage right yeah. um that's actually for kind of goes into our next um, suggestion, which is location by funding source, um, which kind of goes into the TIFFs. Um, and I kind of, you know, here's a map if you're interested. Uh, Brandon Boyce, please jump in if I totally, you know. Sure. Um, misguide this information. <laughs> well, I could just give a quick overview. Mm -hmm. um, the arts grants are funded by three funding sources. Um, two are TIF districts and one is general fund money. Um, money coming from uh, any given TIF should be spent uh, really only on a project in that TIF. Um, so uh, this proposal would allow for, you know, we'd modify the grant application so that it'd be clear, identify who's in what location and then uh, 
fund accordingly. And non-TIF could be anywhere in the city, including in a TIF district, actually. So it's not intended to be exclusionary. But as you can see, the majority of the of the grant funds available would be in the downtown, which I think mm -hmm. is fairly was consistent. We, we tend to have original a, intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. As I remember. <laughs> And again, that was uh, also one of Pauline's suggestions. So you're going to require <coughs> whoever, when they're applying them to say which TIF, the, whether it's in one of the TIFs or non-specific. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What the location would be. Yeah. What, yeah. The, so they're, and maybe explain what the TIF district is, what the boundaries are. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, always have a link. been. That's always been in. I think in the materials that went yeah. to the. Yeah, we want to keep that. Yeah. So yeah, basically we want to break it down into three categories and three funding sources. Um, so you know, nonprofit organization, individual groups, and then they would decide which TIF or which area would go into, which also will help decide the budget on where would they spend the funding project. Um, I don't know if you have any more questions or concerns about the categories or TIFs. And at this point, you know, we're just, we want feedback from the commission. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a working group. Um, John and Pat are both serving on that. And we'll have another follow-up meeting with you okay. both um, to, to continue discussing this. So we're not, yeah. um, these aren't final recommendations. Right. So if you had a, a group that was nonprofit in TIF 1, how would they decide whether they we're in the nonprofit category, we're in the groups category. If they're a registered nonprofit, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you're located, your organization's based, it matters where you're doing the project. Is that? I'm, yeah, I'm, the TIF applies sure. to where the project actually takes place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not where the people are located okay. or, the, or the groups. I understand that, but yeah. I'm saying if in the categories, not the funding sources, but how would you know if you were a group, that a singing group or something like that? Mm -hmm. You were a non-for-profit kind of singing group. Would you go for the non-for-profit organization or would you go for the groups category? I think you'd probably go for the ensemble would be my guess. And that uh, would be group groups or non-for-profit? Um, mm -hmm. Groups. I, I see. We so defined it as ensembles in the previous one. So yeah. they can fall into two categories technically. It's, it's not exclusive. Exclusionary. So then that would lead to more confusion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think I think the it's dynamic. Music, it's got to be not for profit. I, I think the dynamic Pauline was trying to set up was that the jury, so you would have, you know, it would be you'd be individual artists competing amongst individual artists, you know, organizations competing with organizations, organizations and ensembles or troops competing with. Right, troops. but then you do are going to have some ensembles that are nonprofit. Because they've been around yeah. long enough and they it's set themselves up there. It's way. true, yeah. yeah. That, that was my question. Yeah. What yeah. category would they fall into then? That's the they could choose. <laughs> yeah, could choose. I, I mean. We have to figure out, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's probably no breakdown that's ever going to be perfect. I mean, that's, based on that's true. Yeah, trust me, we've gone through um, several cycles. <laughs> <laughs> of yeah, trying I, to change things, and then there's, there's always some confusion. Yeah. Right. I didn't yeah. mean to bring up the confusion. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. no, no I, think that, I think the intent is to try to clarify the confusion and avoid yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, we put, um, we really value Pauline's um, opinion on this topic, uh, mm -hmm. but unfortunately I don't know all of her rationale for why she was recommending it this way. So I'm, yeah. um, we can do our best to, to research that more and figure out. Okay. Um, well, why, you might just mention to her yeah. that we had that question. So yeah, my absolutely. guess is it grew out of all the phone calls and emails that she got <laughs> trying to yeah. clarify it, and she began to get a sense. It seemed logical to me that that's probably what, what is behind all this. And as more and more people become aware of this program, and we've all, everybody in this commission has championed it and tried to bring it to the public's awareness, more and more people are applying, and that's where the mm -hmm. right. it's bound to happen. Sure. Uh, anything to make it clearer and more expedient for on both sides, I think, is a good thing. Yeah, I, that that is the intent. I, mm -hmm. yeah. 
But I have a question because I'm I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something on the back page. I don't know if you've turned. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Just we keep have going. Yeah, one we more, haven't gotten one there more. yet. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll wait. Because this is a <laughs> it's a little bit of a a switch. But um, the concept of free and open to the <coughs> public requirement. Um, now there are some things that were brought to my attention that should some projects be allowed to charge a small fee. An example of this specifically was the Champagne Urbana Symphony Orchestra, um, and they have done grants for the, a few years in a row, and um, kind of their overlapping problem is that they have to charge a small student fee of $2 per student, which is significantly reduced to what normally um, they charge, and they also have a specific audience, which is students. So the question behind this and, you know, something to think about is whether or not um, this can, you know, be allowed or whether or not they should have a criteria whether it's a nonprofit can be allowed to do this or submit a letter explaining why or if that adds up into more gray area. So um, that was just kind of a a very specific situation and of other um, organizations just like that. What, why, does, why does this stop them from being a nonprofit? Um, Do they say this is specifically profit? This is not for profit. So this is a, this is a nonprofit organization. So um, I guess we're confused about well, why they have to charge a fee. And I'm not, I'm a member of the symphony and Jenny's a member of the guild and uh, where, where did this information come from? Oh, well, I, I remember when I was on the, um, when we select, when we were selecting the group that I did, this, this came up in the meeting I was in that they, that they charge $2. I was not aware of that. I, I know Cranard itself charges when it's a concert because it's their oh. ticket fee, that's their ticket overhead, but I there are no tickets and it's a free event. I th well, I think that, I f you know, I, I, I don't remember exactly, but I know I'm sure Pauline does. Um, <laughs> but I think it was something to do with, uh, it, it, w it went to Cranard or Cranard had something to do with it. I, I could be yeah, wrong. Yeah, it would but not it be the symphony. It would be, it, um, yeah. so just to make it clear, we, we need to, to find out about this because I know they're free concerts. So it's more of a Cranard charge or it's something for the buses. Yeah, but it's, the symphony yeah. does not charge for those concerts. As a matter of fact, Jenny raises money so they can be free. <laughs> so I think we need a clarification on that one. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to. I'm not entirely sure, and this might be not be a per person charge. Is it? Is it possibly a charge per student? It's to per the student. School? It's through the school. Um, so, you know, this is another thing that I'm you know, not entirely sure about. Um, so I'm just kind of throwing off of my ideas, but uh, I know that they have definitely tried to make it not any charge at all, but w for whatever reason, there is a $2 per student um, charge for this event. Um, I think it's just because it's, it's such a big event and so many people are involved in the buses and everything that, you know, reducing it to nothing is, um, has, they have trouble undoing this. Um, so I think that the reason that we're, the, you know, Pauline included this in her recommendations, um, and the real question is, should we allow in our granting process some way that, you know, people can explain the situation, explain why there's a fee, and, and see if administratively we can make an exception that is opening the door yeah, it could I lead us to, you know, having to tell a lot of um, promoters or, you know, uh, other profitable enterprises, perhaps, telling people no or having, having to spend a lot of time looking at those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it's really a, an open question to the commission as to whether or not this is a, a path you want us to look at more. Mm -hmm. this, was, this is the only issue like this, right? That I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think we identified any others. I, I think this is, we I'm should not, just look I'm, into this. I'm, Cause I'm, yeah, I think it's yeah. the only one. And yeah. we were, because I was with the group that went over it, and it was, we were all confused. I know that it made more sense when we had, because it had an explanation for what, mm -hmm. what the charge was for and who, what it went to, but I, it, you know, I, I can't remember what it was. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to find out. I've just sent a text message to the executive <laughs> director to see if, and see if he, and he's usually pretty good about answering. So we'll find out, because 
in 31 years, this is new to me, and mm -hmm. I used to be on the board for so nine years. So I'm, I'm surprised, unless this is a very recent charge that has happened. So we will look sure. into this specific situation, yes. but we won't um, pursue changing anything about the I grant program. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we agree. All right. Um, and those are um, basically the topics that we uh, came up with. So. Okay. So are there any other issues anyone on the commission would like to raise now, even just questions or, you know, random, random thoughts about the, the grants program? We're all ears. I do have a question about the new cycle when application, because I looked on the website today, I was recommending to a group that mm -hmm. had contacted me, and I went on to the web page, and the information for the next cycle has not b been That's correct, updated yeah. yet. And... Um, I explained to them we're in transition right now, so. But I was curious as to when the next cycle will. Or do we know yet? Soon. <laughs> <laughs> TBA. Is, is the best answer I have for you. I'm sorry. Well, I I, I realize we're behind uh, in, in our mm -hmm. our normal scheduling plan, right. but I was curious if you knew anything. And I just said, well, keep watching, and I'll try to find out some information for you. Otherwise, you know, go to the website and keep keep an eye. Yeah. And we will, we will promote it heavily mm -hmm. once it's... No, I'm sure you will. And we have the Facebook page and the Twitter page and everything. And right. the, new, the um, newsletter that comes out with the, from the UBA. So there's a lot of ways to get the word out. Of course, I guess the News Gazette will be another. Right. And the radio station and things. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, absolutely. When in doubt, I send them to the website. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So that's what I was going to ask is how the word gets out that these grants are available. But you basically answered that question. I think we try to hit every uh, opportunity we can. We've tried over the years to figure out all the ways we can make this more uh, visible to the community because it took a while for people to, to catch oh, yeah. on. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, social media certainly has helped, mm -hmm. but anything we can do, and sometimes we've had um, the coordinators go on to the talk radio various like the WILL and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Connect FM. Yeah, we FM. sent out a press release. We mm -hmm. tried to have the, the coordinators go on and talk. And any opportunity we had to talk about the good work of the commission, we, we've tried to explore it. And we've typically had uh, in-person presentations as informational sessions, and um, the College of Fine and Applied Arts actually already had a proactive informational session oh. uh, that Michelle Plant put together <coughs> for good. students in the program, basically just sort of encouraging them to look at the program, and uh, she said I think they had record turnout this year so mm -hmm. that outreach effort has been growing and they view it as a great opportunity they want to let their students know about. Well, she yeah. was actually on the original she group was. that, that for, uh, founded the grants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. 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 So All she's right. helping from afar, not so far. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't, uh, did anyone else want to say anything about the grants right now? Okay, I think we'll go ahead then with the uh, monthly progress report. So for a uh, monthly progress report is um, we have the arts and the, the schools. Um, previously, there was a jury consisting of three people and a meeting held on October 9th where they selected three schools to be in the final process. Um, we actually, there is an update on this, so we have two jury members who have confirmed and then earlier today we now have Rachel Storm who is now also going to be serving on the jury, and that meeting will be held on November 19th to select the winner, and then, you know, we will definitely send out a notification letter when that is decided on. Um, yep. Since I was on that panel, and when it was my understanding that when we left the meeting that the three of us had discussed having continuity and that we all three had agreed to continue for the next round. So I found out by reading it in this report, 
have the other two members of that original panel been informed that their services are not needed? Because um, I was not aware that this had changed until I read this, this um, oh. report. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I wasn't uh, aware that we were gonna have the same jury. Um, well, it's, I'm sure it got lost in the cracks between the previous intern, but that was the final decision of the panel the day we left the meeting was that we should continue I'm, so that we had continuity. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I don't believe that a jury has any authority to dictate the we, they, we were asked, of a future jury. But we were asked, and we all agreed to serve. I'm so sorry, I'm just the, saying. The former intern probably should not have asked that question of okay. the jury. That was but, inappropriate. Okay, well, regardless, it ha happened. I understand that okay, now. Okay, so we, we need but to But we need to inform the two other people who were there that day because they probably are the, of the same. And I was wondering, because we had agreed the next deadline had been November 7th and obviously it got pushed back and I understand all the reasons it's gotten pushed back mm -hmm. but we should have give them the courtesy of letting them know if they haven't already been told yeah like I I was also unaware of of that I I know that um, I was mentioned to that we wanted to have three different juries just to have new eyes and new perspective on who was applying Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a different point of view. Um, no, we had talked it. about that, and I was I thought that was going to happen, and then the the decision was made that we should keep continuity with the panel for the next round. So I I assumed it was going to continue. So I, I mean it's fine, and I'm glad Ginny's is, is serving. So, um, but I think we just should let the other other two people know in case th they were wondering what like I was what was happening and I knew things were falling in the cracks with the transition I understand that mm -hmm. but um, I think just let them know will do thank you sure um, for the artist of the quarter Ellie is currently um, the artist and Peggy Flav Flavin hopefully I pronounced her name correctly uh, was supposed to be next but she had to cancel However, there is an update as well. We have Travis Hocutt, who is now going to be the new Artist of the Quarter, and he is going to install on November 23rd, which is a little bit later than uh, originally planned, but that is going to be done. And if you would like to know a little bit about Travis, um, he is a current resident at the Urbana-Champaign Independent Media Center. His work has been exhibited both locally and internationally, and he re revolves around the theme of exploration, usually in outer space, and engages the physical and experimental limits of our, perce of our perception. There we go. Um, so that's a little bit about Travis Hokut. Did Travis also present at the expo? Yes, yeah. he, he did. He was at the expo. I was just about to look up. He, um, he's also presenting an exhibit at the Amara Yoga Studio in Lincoln Square soon. Hmm. I can get you the dates if you need it. Your yes. studio? Sure. That would be it's great. In your mind, yeah. I got yeah. an invitation today to attend it. Um, and then we have, once again, marketing continues to update programs on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, those are things that are always in progress, and um, any suggestions or updates that we should post on marketing is appreciated to be mentioned too. Um, so we have um, also Art Now is still uh, going on with episodes. Um, <laughs> just kind of the highlights of of what's um, what's kind of going on. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let's just uh, greet Miranda McCarthy and say thank you for coming. <laughs> and <laughs> thank and you. Our intern. We really appreciate that. Uh, you're also a marketing intern, is that correct? Yes, yeah, okay. I am. Yeah. So she's got two hats. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but we're very glad you've joined us. Thank you. Yeah, nothing like hitting the ground running, huh? <laughs> 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 Does anyone else want to make some announcements here? 
I have a couple of announcements that sure, have go to ahead. do with arts. Uh, mm -hmm. One, I want to remind everybody that the Arts and Crafts Show will be held in the Urbana Civic uh, Center, Center this weekend, this weekend mm -hmm. Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And there's some excellent professional artists that display their work there and sell it. So if you are looking for Christmas presents, you might want to go over there and check mm -hmm. that out. It's, a, it's always a nice exhibit. Yes. And then uh, the Symphony Guild is, uh, that we were talking about, the Symphony. They are having a couple of in good taste parties that you can go to a couple of nice homes in that. So you can check with the uh, Champaign-Urbana Symphony Guild and those parties are coming up uh, December 3rd and February 6th, but they're on our agenda. So we raise money for the Champaign-Urbana Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. with these dinners. So thank you, Pat. Sure. Uh, Brandon, you do I just um, wanted to note that the Folk and Roots Festival happened in downtown Urbana this past yes. weekend. Um, my understanding it was a, a, a good success. A lot of people came downtown. Great. And there's also a pop-up shop right now on Main Street by Norden Design. It's small paper crafts, I think. Uh, so just another interesting thing happening in Great. downtown. Very good. It's, can I make an announcement? It's yeah. not an Urbana event, although it involves Urbana residents okay. and artists. Um, the Emanuel uh, um, Memorial Chapel in downtown Champaign has a free public concert Friday night at 7.30. Okay. Um, would someone like to move that we adjourn? I so move. Second. We're done. <laughs>